Hello. Hi. Here we go, everyone's awake. Awesome. So, uh, I'm Mary Williams. Uh, I'm South African. I talk too quickly. I swear a lot, which isn't really about South African, but being at like a boarding school when I was a teenager. It's a whole thing. <laughs> Therapy build and getting started. Um, I am uh, from a very technical background. I, used, I, I was uh, putting together my own, I was soldering computer parts when I was about eight or ten years old. I couldn't afford computers, so I got some broken parts and put one together. Um, and then ended up doing artificial intelligence research and stuff like that. Uh, and then moved into being a corporal for about a decade, uh, which was good fun. Um, the, the most interesting things I've done in my life, I've written a book. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was part of a project where I, I got to um, build part of South Africa's first satellite. Who's got kids? Don't let them do anything cool when they're young. Because <laughs> like, when you have soldered something that's gone into space when you're 16, it is all downhill from <laughs> Sheltered, doing boring things, no major achievements, and then you know they have a chance of a happy adulthood. Um, I, uh, I I worked in a really big company for a lot for a long time, and then uh, kind of it finally managed to get terminal escape velocity and, and left and went and worked with a bunch of the the lovely GDS folk who are here um, and worked on GPK where I did do other stuff, but I think my major achievement was this cake for 300 people um, that was bigger than this table, um, which was you know one of my weirder management achievements. Um, so I spent my first 10 years in a, in, a, in a corporation that sounds a lot like Statoil from, um, from, from the, the, the discussion earlier on. Um, and it was actually a really great company. They were famous for investing in people. They produced more CXOs, so CEOs, COOs, and CMOs and whatnot for other companies than any other company in the world. And so they were really famous for developing leaders. And so the one thing that was good about that is they had an extraordinarily mature people development process. And they were weird in that they still had this promote from within approach. So the only way to get to be senior in this company was to join as a basically a, a new graduate or when they bought your company. That was it. So if you worked for um, one of the companies that they bought, you might come in at a higher level, but otherwise you kind of joined at 20 something and were there for another 30 or 40 years. Um, which sounds terrible, but they moved you around enough that you didn't you know, die of boredom. Um, and so everybody had a work plan and a personal development plan and a career plan with a complete with skills matrix and uh, a manager. And most of them did actually give a which was nice. Um, and everybody had a coach and they usually had a mentor as well. And they had monthly one-to-ones and quarterly reviews and annual reviews and 10 days a year to spend on, trend on training. And it was all very, very structured. And it was probably like every HR book that had been written in the last 140 years, they had followed the, the advice of the day and tried to be as good as possible. And to some extent, they were they, they, they were fairly successful that, for, with that. So the good stuff, people, people knew what the plan was. People had a structure. They, they knew how to progress in their career. They knew how to get better at their specialism. Um, but as a manager, you ended up feeling like you were sort of burdened under these immensity of checklists. Um, and for anybody who's ever tried to work with an agile team, but to write somebody's plan, of, their work plan for the year ahead, when they haven't actually got a defined plan for the sprint ahead, um, it's really difficult, right? Um, and, and then th that had some bad after effects as well, in terms of the, the ugly after effects of that. Has everybody watched Black Books? Yeah. 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 So for anybody who hasn't watched Black Books, you must, uh, uh, not least because as a foreigner, it's a wonderful insight into British culture. Um, <laughs> but but th this is a point where, um, I think his name's Bernard, the, the character. Uh, he is avoiding doing his tax returns. Um, th this is my favorite moment where he makes, a, he makes a coat out of all of the receipts for the year. So one of the, one of the really negative things yeah. is that you ended up with managers who started out caring about people, ending up doing fantastically complicated things to avoid doing personal development plans, work plans, annual reviews, quarterly reviews, uh, but also that people ended up with a bit of compassion for team. They were running on empty by the end of all of these checklists and all these processes. And so a lot like Debbie was talking about on the first day, they ended up too immersed in all of the, the minutiae of the process and forgot that it was all about the people. And so you can adjust this way of working when, when you start to move agile. I had the unusual, um, interesting journey of moving the largest, the, the team that managed financial systems in the largest SAP install in the world um, over to using Agile. Uh, so yes, I used to work with SAP, but I'm okay now. Um, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't feel quite right. And so for, for a lot of the, the last little while I've been working on what would work better 
um, for, for both stealing from Agile to, to do better people management, but also how do you manage people really well and help, help them be the best they can be um, when they're working in an Agile context. And so some would argue that we don't need managers at all in Agile, and I would agree that there is, there is room for that opinion, um, but I would argue that we need good managers and we need to get rid of bad bosses. Because everybody hates bad bosses, right? Everybody loves Dilbert because it's so funny, because it's so true. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we hate bad bosses. We describe them as clueless. We describe them as empty suits. We describe them as pointless. <coughs> Does everybody know the, the seagull style of management? <coughs> fly in, shout at everybody, shit on everything, fly away again. <laughs> um, you don't want that. That, that, is, that is bad boss. Let, let's, let's make boss a bad thing and manager. Let's reclaim that. We can make it a good thing again. Um, and so my approach to being bad boss is <laughs> this thing in particular. <laughs> also, the best cat. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can just sit down now and watch this for the next half hour, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, years ago, uh, Catherine <laughs> um, uh, tweeted this, which is the three kinds of manager. This umbrella, this funnel, and this fan. You're, you're either stopping it hitting your people, making it hit them very directly, or spreading it all around. <laughs> and, and, and I would argue that the good managers are both these umbrellas. Your, your first job is to make sure that crap that does not matter to your people does not hit them. Um, but they're also a lot more than that. And I, I am geeky enough about management, as well as being geeky enough about tech, that I, I have read management books. Uh, but again, I'm okay now. Um, and what I found was essentially that traditional management beliefs are a pile of crap. Um, what is very interesting is that if you go to a management school and a management department and, and look at the actual textbooks today, none of them say what people in business tell you is the traditional management way. There's very little in the, if, 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 if we were up to date with management in the same way we're up to date with code, we would not be trying to do this stuff the wrong way anymore because they have moved on. We just haven't been paying enough attention. So if we go, traditional management beliefs are a pile of crap. That is a pile of them from my home country. Um, what does work? There is one good management book and I would recommend everybody read it. I will tweet the links to these slides and to all of the books later. Um, it's called First Break All the Rules. Uh, and it's really interesting because it's completely data focused. They went out and, uh, I think it's Gallup, that they went and interviewed over 100,000 organizations and managers. And they went to each organization and went, what's your best performing unit? Who's, who's knocking it out the park? Which restaurant is the one that is just amazing compared to all the other ones? Which of your divisions is the most profitable? Who's got the, you know, who, who is just doing brilliantly on the business side? And then they worked out what was great about how that organization was managed. Um, and they came up with these uh, 12 predictors of high performance. I'm done. This is all you No. So we're all drowning in 12 predictors of high performance. That's pretty hard. And so let's, let's abstract a little bit. Let's use that bit of our brain that, that helps us when we abstract first and then go into the detail. Um, has everybody, who's read Drive? Or Yes, a few, okay. And um, for those who haven't, there's a brilliant uh, <coughs> sketch noted voice of it, which again I'll link to. Um, so, uh, Dan Pink in Drive talks about how really what motivates us is having purpose, knowing what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, having autonomy, getting some say in what and how and why we're doing it, um, and mastery, feeling like you're good at what you do every day. Um, and so, when I, um, well, and then mine is only negative factors that detract. You can have all the purpose, autonomy, and mastery in the world, but if you put people in a very hot room with very tiny desks and you know, Windows machines, then it's never going to go well. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so when we, when we take that framework, okay, so actually a lot of these, a lot of these individual uh, predictors of whether a team will be high performing, they fit into autonomy, <coughs> mastery, and purpose. Um, and so I'll uh, <coughs> the reading of the very specific uh, factors uh, for later. They don't all fit in there though, and that's what I find particularly interesting about this. So I, I have another talk I do which is about diversity, which I start wearing my t-shirt that says I'm the one the Daily Mail warned you about, <laughs> because I am, I am uh, foreign and uh, 
you know, I, and I'm working, which is a bad thing. If I weren't working, I'd be stealing your benefits, but I am working, so I'm stealing your jobs. And I'm gay, so I'm also stealing your women. <laughs> one of my teams did get me a stealing your women and your jobs shirt at one point. Um, my wife is English as well, so it's always... <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and so, so diversity and inclusion matters to me because I'm kind of in the minority in a lot of ways. I also have a disability and, and a load of stuff like that. Um, so the, the stuff that doesn't fit into purpose, autonomy, and, uh, and mastery kind of fits into inclusion. It's about whether you, whether you feel like you're respected and rewarded, whether you can be yourself and succeed. Uh, Stonewall did some really interesting research where they found when people had to hide who they really were in the workplace, they were 30% less productive than they could be. And so it can genuinely make your team more effective if people feel like they can be themselves. And that, that isn't just wearing shorts when everybody else wears trousers, it can also be <laughs> slightly more, um, slightly less obvious things. Um, and the, the, your real job as a manager is to create, create space for people to be awesome. Because I don't know anybody who goes to work every day and goes, you know what, today I'm uh, aiming for average to sh <laughs> <laughs> Average to is exactly what I've aspired to be for my entire life, and uh, and I look forward to today reaching a new low, <laughs> producing producing less value for this company uh, than I have ever produced before. Um, because people don't want to be, people want to be awesome. I, I think people get ground down, and people get okay with the idea that maybe they have to be in a in a place that they don't care about doing a job they think is pointless. <coughs> Um, massaging a budget that nobody is going to look at, right? But people want to be good at what they do. Um, and so whether you're a, you're a manager, then your job is to create that space. Or even if you're just an individual who's, who's there, you need to find and shape space where you can be the best that you can be. Um, and one of the things that I, I love in Agile, and one of the reasons that I'm such a, a, an enthusiastic adopter of, of Agile and of Lean, is that you get a lot of purpose, autonomy, and mastery for free if you have a, if you have self-organizing teams working in an agile way. And um, this is a um, uh, for anybody who doesn't know Paul Downey. He's one of the uh, tech arcs at, uh, at GDS who also has a wonderful flair for drawing very um, sometimes on the nose post-it notes. There, there's a whole set of them at the at the link that's, that's there. Um, but what, one of the things that GDS says and, and Agile generally says is the unit of delivery is the team. We don't need to assess whether an individual did everything that 12 months ago we said they should do in their work this year. We need to assess whether we have built the product that we said we were going to, we have served the customers that we need to, we have, we have achieved the business results that, that, we, that we need to. Um, and so there's a lot of that stuff that we, we kind of get for free, either if we're in a really small organization or if we've managed to work with Agile in, in, a, in a good way. So purpose, if you, if you, have, a, if you have a team that is um, doing Agile but doesn't know what they're doing, I'd argue you're not really doing Agile, right? I, I think people need to be connected with um, the customer, connected with the product. Uh, they need to understand what they're, what they're trying to achieve in order to have any chance of prioritizing and, and doing that well. Um, the, the autonomy piece is about th that whole piece about teams getting to decide what they, what they do and don't include, whether you're doing Scrum, uh, Scrum or, or Kanban or, or whatever. And ma mastery is one of the ones that I see the most often causing problems, actually, when people feel like uh, moving fast and breaking things is, is meaning that they're a bad engineer because they're creating so much technical debt or, or, or stuff like that. So finding that balance is not, not always easy but always worth investing in. Um, and then that inclusion piece of do I, do I belong here? Um, one, of the, one of the things that occurred to me in the session before, um, it, and I, I tweeted a bit about it, was it's great to hire friends of friends. Um, but your seed group has to be diverse enough that you don't just end up with a, with a, with a monoculture. Um, one, of the, one of the best things I learned over the years doing lots of diversity and inclusion work, the number one predictor of um, both whether you can attract, recruit, and retain great people is their ability to agree with somebody like me can be successful here. And I think I have that slide in a bit later. But every time that you're looking at hiring or growing your team, Think about whether a diverse enough group of people are going to go. Yeah, I could be awesome here. And I think when we when we see some of the problems we see with bro culture and uh, monocultures in our industry, some of that is accidentally ending up um, with a culture where most people who aren't exactly like the people who are already there look at it and go, 
Yeah, no, that is going to be an uphill walking on glass struggle every day. I'm not going to go there. Um, so, so think about how attractive you are to people who are different from yourself when you're, when you're hiring as well. Would be the one thing I'd add. Um, but these, this is the thing. Is it's kind of kind of reminiscent of the Agile Manifesto, right? And so, individual and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation. I will relate that to people. Just you watch. Um, <laughs> customer collaboration and responding to change. And so the first one's easy, right? Individuals and interactions and processes and tools. Don't don't be Bernard with his coat of VAT receipts. Try try and try and remember that the people are at the heart of what you're doing whenever you're managing people. Do great one to ones. And I, I think one to ones are hugely valuable um, but often misused. So if your one to ones are basically you getting a status update on what the individual has been working on, then you are you should be getting that information somewhere else. The, the one-to-one -one is about that person and their um, their career and their aspirations and whether they feel like they're growing and, and they're learning. And so if you find that you're spending half that one-to-one -one just talking about what the, how their project's going um, with the with the intent that you know how their project's going, then you need to fix that and find find what the right way is for you to know status. Because one to ones are not a status update. They should be more like personal retrospectives. They should be you helping coach um, the the individual and go, what what went well, what didn't, what would you like to choose to change, and what how can I help you do that? And I, and I think one of the most one of the very most powerful things, having, having grown up in a massive corporation um, that did uh, end of project, uh, I think they called them post-mortems, which I thought was hilarious, because something has to have died for you to do a post-mortem, <laughs> right? Um, and, and they do these post-mortems after major projects and go, oh yeah, we've, we've got all these learnings. Learnings is not a word, people. Um, <laughs> we've got all these learnings now, and then they would do the same wrong on the next <laughs> because, because you don't need that at the end of the project. You don't need to look back on the dead body of your project and figure out why it died. You need to make sure that you keep it alive through the whole thing. So retrospectives are one of my very favorite things about Agile. Um, and so, so adjust your one-to-ones. Do, do one-to-ones that are much more like personal, uh, personal retrospectives. Um, and remember to care about the whole person. It is absolutely a myth that people can leave their personal life at the door. That is. Anybody who tells you that that is true, it is. <laughs> um, do, don't expect people to be a, a different professional person when they are when they're in the office. Um, that if if they've got a sick kid at home, they can't forget that. They wouldn't be a decent human being if they if they could. You wouldn't want them working with you if they could. So so don't. It, it's a fallacy. Don't don't pretend that that's possible. Um, and then cultivate inclusion. Um, and this is the. So think about whether if you if you brought if you look at your current team, you think about a wildly different perspective that would be hugely valuable because it's a wildly different perspective. Would those people go, yeah, somebody like me can be successful on? And it's very important how this is phrased, because if you if you ask me, can you be successful here, I can tell you right now that I used to be a bouncer, so my, my reaction is my kind of like in your damn face. Uh, kind of <laughs> squaring up, of course I can, because that's a challenge, and everybody will rise to a challenge or slink away, but um, you, you, don't, you don't need the answer to, can this individual face up to the hardship of being here? You need, can somebody like them succeed there? And asking the question in that way is very interesting, um, because it makes people think about think in a much, in a much broader way. This is when you find out that, so, that, that the, the one woman in your team <coughs> wouldn't actually recommend that any other woman join the team because she finds it so hard. Um, it's when you find that the, um, the, the, one, the, the one Muslim person on your team finds it really hard every year that people keep offering them food when he's fasting and nobody is respectful of that. Um, uh, but but it, it, can, it can even be down to the one guy who didn't already work with you all at the same company previously finds it really uncomfortable. Um, but, but remember to phrase it uh, as an as a abstract, somebody like me. Okay. So back to the working software bit, right? And I can tell. You're skeptical. Um, I'm, ta I'm taking a, a page out of, out of a presentation yesterday, which basically like, you, you do much better as soon as you have cats in your presentation. Um, 
I did fine. I, I, I literally sat for half an hour last night desperately trying to find a way to include a gif of um, this like puppy discovering um, what putting its head in a swimming pool was like. And I just couldn't. I, I, I might have to tweet it later just so that you get the enjoyment of it, but I, I couldn't shoehorn it in uh, how hard I tried. Um, but I, I would argue that it does, the, 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 way I, the way I think it's relevant is that I think the reason why we value working software over comprehensive documentation is that, to horribly misquote Johnny Mitchell, we, we don't know what we want till it's done. Um, we, we, we need the feedback loop. Um, a, a lot of the reason that writing the spec, the 200 page spec, I've actually had to review a 200 page spec before SAP. I'm okay now. Um, but we need that feedback loop and we, and we have to, to iterate and to learn, right? Um, and and the, the, the science of how we learn and how we develop skills actually supports this. So um, who's read Outliers? It's the more popular one, only a few people. Um, Talent, anybody read Talent and Over? It's always one. High five. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Talent and Overrated is basically a, be a better summary of the science that, that Gladwell uh, pulls upon when he wrote, uh, when he wrote Outliers, uh, and it's a bit more balanced, um, as is the way. Um, and what was interesting in Talent is Overrated is it's all based on some science where people went looking for talent. And they went looking for talent in areas where people genuinely believed that it existed and it mattered. Um, and those areas were music and sport, because people genu genuinely do believe music, you've either got it or you haven't, sport, you've either got it or you haven't. And so they, they were, what they were really doing was doing research so that they could, they could find a way to test for that talent early, so that if you were going to be a world-class violinist, they could snatch you when you were three and produce you into a, uh, a world-class violinist rather than, you know, letting it go to the lottery that you, uh, you tried recorder first. Um, but what they found was that they couldn't find talent. Um, genuine, this is where the 10,000 hour rule comes from. They genuinely couldn't find talent in, in either sport uh, or music because it all seemed to be about how much deliberate practice people had done by the time they, uh, by the time they became a professional. Um, one of the most interesting ones was in ice hockey. Um, because in ice hockey, you, um, you start very young, I think, I believe in Canada. You start when you're like four years old, you'll play. And the school year is decided by when you were born in the years, whether you're going to get into that school, which is pretty simple. And almost all professional ice hockey players are born in January, February, and March. And that's because they are that much bigger and that slightly a bit older at the point that they start school. And actually, when you're four years old, three months is a hell of a lot of extra like size and coordination. And so they end up playing better when they're four, which means they get selected for the better team, which means they play more weekends. And because ice hockey is a specialist sport, you, have, you can't really like, there's not a lot you can do if it's just you and your buddies, right? You need a rink, you need skates, you need a component, component to beat the crap out of, seemingly. Um, and so the, it, it's a snowball effect. But if you, if you were born earlier in the year, when you are four, you start stronger, taller, better coordinated, and 20 years later, we're still reaping the benefit of that because of how it's, how it's structured. Interestingly, basketball is not the same. Basketball, anybody can improve their basketball skills as long as they can find a hoop and a ball and a couple of other kids in the neighborhood who will play with them, or even just a hoop and a ball, because you can do a lot of skill development without anybody to play against. And so you don't see the same thing because that snowball effect hasn't happened. You probably do still need to be six foot seven, but that's, that's an actual physical requirement, right? Um, and so what do we learn then from, from deliberate practice? We need to be, to be to, the definition of deliberate practice is basically how do you find your flow state? It needs to be hard enough to challenge you, um, so not, not so easy that you, that you get bored, um, but just hard enough that it challenges you rather than frustrating you. And so you, you, it should take into account your pre-existing knowledge, it should, and you should get immediate informative feedback. Again, sounds quite familiar to what we, what we aim for in Agile, right? And you should repeatedly re perform the same or similar tasks so that you know that you're getting better. One um, real advantage that uh, professional sports players have over us mere mortals is they get to practice and then perform. I don't feel many of my days at work that I'm practicing. <laughs> you kind of feel like you're performing the whole time, right? And so carving out time in what you're doing, how you're doing it, 
and remembering to do that kind of personal retrospective to figure out um, what you learn from it and how you how you change in the future is really important. Um, and so think about whether your work is designed in a way that it makes it effective as, as deliberate practice. And there are things you can do if it's not, right? If you're doing really boring work, ask for more challenging stuff. There are very few managers I've ever met who will go, no, no, I'd like you to be bored, and I don't need this stuff doing urgently. I'll have to do that myself because I'd rather you were bored. Um, feedback is about building trust. That you're, If you ask people who you don't like for feedback, it is pointless because you will hate them more and you will not take their feedback. Um, but, but finding people who you trust to go, did I do all right at that? How could I do better? Um, I thought this went well or that went well. Is that, is that the same as you? Um, and building that relationship with your manager that they will tell you the truth about how you're doing as well is important. Um, and so let's figure out how we can learn in our work as well as doing our work. Um, in terms of the I think the main thrust of the customer collaboration over contract negotiation for managers is stop pretending you're in charge of an army, because you're not. And frankly, if we armed all of the devs and the zombie and the zombie apocalypse came, trust me, we are the first to die. <laughs> like the zombie will eat you when you're looking for a place to charge your phone. Because frankly, that's what we'd all be doing on like hour 13 hour seven for those with iPhones, right? Um, and so we, 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 need to, we need to stop pretending that command and control is viable. Again, what's interesting, like the fighter pilot pilot's analogy, even the army knows command and control isn't necessarily the right thing for all instances, right? They have a very different approach in the heat of battle where um, hierarchy absolutely does matters and matter and orders must be followed to the rest of the time where it is fine to have ideas even if you're a grunt. You just can't have ideas in the middle of being shot at. Yeah? I would argue that even the most stressful sprint is not the same as being shot at. So try not to adopt command and control just because it's day T minus two to the end of your sprint. Um, the other thing that's very difficult for people who are new to management or who are old to very command and control management is to remember that it's fine for people to do things different ways. And so valuing the what over the how. Um, Know when people need telling what to do, but trust me, it's not very often. Um, help them get what they need the rest of the time. It's usually not just somebody else telling them what to do. Um, and learn coaching skills. Uh, I cannot emphasize how wonderful it is to work with people who have learned some coaching skills. Uh, I don't have time in the session today to do like coaching one-on-one -on -one with you guys, but I have written about it, and there are lots of other people who've written about it too. Take an hour, invest a little in that. Your peers will love you. Um, and. One of the ways I, uh, this is my, this is my favorite and only matrix in, in this uh, presentation, um, which uh, if you are very corporate, you might have seen before as the situ situational leadership uh, matrix approach, uh, which I call clue skills. Because basically people either, uh, people sometimes know exactly what needs doing, have all the skills, all the knowledge, and all, all the uh, resource in the like money and stuff way, not people. Um, People are not. Anybody who calls people a resource, they usually a manager, immediately we start referring to them as overhead. It teaches them the lesson very <laughs> quickly. <laughs> um, so, people who know what to do and are equipped to do it um, are in that kind of top quadrant, right? But then there are people who they know what needs doing, but they don't know how to get there yet. That they need different help than the people who, who, who are in the top right quadrant. Some people have got the skills, but they've got no idea what they should be doing this week. Uh, and some people are just like, what? Huh? I just graduate. Huh? You want me to do the what now, the where? And uh, they are the only people, people in this bit, are the only people you should ever give direct instructions to. If you give direct instructions to anybody else, you are being a bad boss, please don't do it. Or at least wear a pointy haired boss wig. Because then that will lighten up the environment for everyone. Um, so, what do people need? If you are in the top right hand corner, you know what to do and how to do it, you need your manager to be a cheerleader and a bulldozer. Their job is to go, you're awesome, and to get shit out of your way. And that's it. And they're great. And people are not like uniquely in one space forever, but on a particular task or a particular project, they're in one space. Um, people who have skills and need direction, they need direction. 
uh, some of the stuff that was talked about this morning in, in the keynote is really helpful here because as soon as you become more transparent with what your organization is trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it, people get clue. They get, they get able to figure out what the next thing is that's most important that they need to work on and they're able to, to um, direct themselves without having to, to look for somebody else to, to give them that. Um, people who know what needs doing but need some, some new skills or new knowledge, often the best way to give them that is to pair them with somebody um, to work with someone and, and learn those skills. Very occasionally you'll want to send them on a, on a course probably not a certification given some of the other opinions <laughs> expressed over the last couple of days. Um, but, but often you want to pair them up with somebody else who knows. If you're really lucky that somebody else is in your organization already and you just sit them next to each other and make sure that they don't kill each other. Um, if, you're, if, if you're less lucky then you need to look further afield. Um, but you know what? I, I don't know anybody who's ever had someone come to them and go, I think you're good at this. I'd like to learn it. Could I learn it from you? Most people's reaction isn't off, uh, that's hard-earned knowledge, I'm not sharing you, right? <laughs> Most people are really quite quite impressed that you noticed they were good at it, and really quite chuffed that you asked. Um, and so people are lovely, you know, treat them as such. Um, when people are in that bottom quadrant and they're learning new skills, remember how skills are built. Um, and so uh, I, I, I'm in the southwest, so I can use a driving analogy, which in London everybody always looks at me like, how does this relate to the tube? Because uh, nobody drives. Um, but when you're learning to drive, you start out unconsciously incompetent, which doesn't mean paralytic drunk. Uh, it means, um, or it may do. It may do. I, don't, I don't know your history, right? Um, but you, you start out not knowing what, what you're doing wrong, and not able to do it. So you sit in the car, you have gears, what are these? How does this work, right? And then you move on to being a, a learner driver. You are consciously <laughs> you, know, you just found the gears, you know you probably should have indicated them, you realise that roundabouts, though efficient, are the most terrifying thing ever. I grew up my entire life, I had never seen a roundabout. I move here, they're everywhere. I'm a beauty of that. That's not very far from Swindon. Has everybody seen the magic round <laughs> about in There is nothing magical about that. If, if that is a magical roundabout, Voldemort had something to do with it. Right? That is the only way that is magic. Magic's but anyway. when you're out the other side. <laughs> Sorry? Magic's when you're marriage active so out the other side. <laughs> yeah. um, you then move on to a newly qualified driver, right? So you, you are consciously competent. You, you, you're driving fine, but it's taking energy. Eventually you get here. Who, who's driven to work and then realise you remember nothing of the day? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Autopilot, right? And so what one of the um has, has everybody seen that Kathy Sierra is back and it's awesome and she's on Twitter and she's serious pony on Twitter. One of the one of the things she she writes and talks about a lot is that people who are unconsciously competent, people who are good at it and don't have to think about how to be good at it anymore, they are often the worst people to learn from because they forget, yeah. because our brains are against us, they forget that they went through this cycle and they, they think about the shortcuts that they have now that help them do stuff and forget that unless you learn the wrong way, those shortcuts are nonsensical. It's like people who learn maths and never really understand numbers but they just know the process for doing long division, not why it works. and so they, Anything that changes, they're the kind of people who are very upset about new maths. New maths is very confusing if you just learn to set rules rather than a set of principles. Um, and, and so remember when you're pairing people up that maybe the guy who knows the most may not be the best person to learn from. Maybe you need somebody who's a bit more along the journey. People who are consciously good at things are often the very best ones to learn from because they're still having to actively be good at it and they're having to think about how they're good at it. Um, Another Paul Downey wonderful um, thing. Um, there, there is also the problem in our industry that sometimes you just don't even know that you don't even know that you don't know how to figure out that you don't even know. Um, <laughs> to go all the way down the, down the lines. Um, uh, and, and so be aware of that as well. Um, one, of, one of the best ways to figure out that somebody is stuck on something is if they're working on the same story for more than two days and they haven't been asking for help yet, they probably don't even know where to start, and that's, and that's where, you, where you figure it out with them. There are definitely people who what they need from you as, as a manager or as a peer is to highlight that blind spot for them, to go, 
this is the thing that you need to get a little bit better at. Okay? And then the other part of being a manager is being a pirate. Doesn't really look like a pirate. Anyway, sorry. It's <laughs> usually not. Um, um, <laughs> so the, the, the other thing that I think, even when we, we get all of the advantages of being in agile teams um, in terms of people management that we don't remember to think about, is the longer, the longer term. Um, and the fact that a career is more than just a series of jobs. And so one of the, um, one of the skills that some of my early managers had that I really benefited from uh, was people who thought very well about what a career was and how, how to, that, and they weren't, they weren't scary. They weren't the kind of people who have a five-year itemized plan of exactly which jobs they're going to do and exactly how they're going to take over the world. Um, my first director um, at P&G, uh, was great. She uh, she told me that every Christmas she took a week and made an active decision about whether to stay um, and uh, stay and do another year um, with the company, <coughs> which was promote from within, which was a long term career, um, or whether to go somewhere else. And so that was the one week where she talked to all the headhunters who would call. Um, she'd uh, have a look at what she was worth, uh, have, have a look around, and that. And so I, I don't do it at Christmas. I have a, there's a week in October where it's like my birthday, and my wedding anniversary. So we tend to go on holiday. And the, do it every year, just going, I will give myself a week to figure out whether keeping doing what I'm doing is a good idea or not. So I'm not sleepwalking through my career is one of the most powerful bits of advice I ever got. Um, and and I'd argue one of the things that that people need in addition to knowing what's going on day to day um, is that piece around mastery. Of how do you get to be even more awesome at the thing that is your specialism? And so um, sometimes folks will need a different person to look up to in their specialism than who their line manager is. And that's totally fine. I'm not, you do not want to learn design skills from me. I have managed designers and it's been fine because we've found them somebody else to look up to <laughs> who can, you know, draw um, and design things, which I definitely can't do, um, to, to learn those skills from. And so. Uh, don't believe that you have to be all things to all people and that, that, that you can't uh, distribute the, those needs. Um, and sometimes your role is to help people realize that they're ready for a bigger challenge. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the really interesting differences um, that I found, I used to run the internship program uh, at P&G for their, uh, their, their IT function. Uh, where we went on a journey, we, had, we, had a, we, only, we only managed to attract about 10% of our interns were women, um, and we, that was our, we were fairly diverse in almost all other ways, but, but never in gender. Um, and we went on a bit of a journey to, um, to move, that, move that up, and we, we got it to about 50% uh, 50% um, uh, which is very unusual, uh, certainly in corporate IT. Um, one of the ways that we did that was that we realized we, we had a role modeling session every, every summer, um, where one way or another, however it was phrased, the, this group of, of students would always end up asking the, the two people that, that, that were role modeling um, whether they always knew they wanted to be so senior. And these were kind of director, vice president level folks in a 140,000 person company. So they, it was a fairly senior role. Um, and we realized after the first couple of years that the guys consistently said, yeah, I always knew I could do more and so I pushed hard to get there. And the women always said, I was terrified, but people I trusted told me I could do it, and I trusted them even when I didn't trust myself. And that that was a really, it was, it was, it happened so often. It was, it was absolutely a theme in what we saw. Um, and so, sometimes your job, as a as a great manager, um, as opposed to a bad boss, is to realise that even though your your team will take a hit in the short term, the right thing for this individual is to help them go do the thing they find terrifying because they're, they're ready for a bigger pond. Um, they're re ready for a different kind of challenge. Um, and helping and supporting people when, when they do that is one of the most powerful things you can do. So yes, so to wrap up, space to be awesome, <coughs> they need purpose, do they believe in why, um, autonomy, do they get to have a say in what, and mastery, they're proud of how they're doing stuff. If you, you bring somebody in and put them in an environment where they end up feeling like they have to do bad work in order to work there, that's never good. Um, and inclusion. Can somebody like them be successful here? Um, and then, you know, don't make them work with 10 year old kit that has a Microsoft label on. Uh, <laughs> and so when we talk about agile people management, do awesome one to ones, 
do, do personal retrospectives. And so if, even if there's just one thing you do, go and do personal retrospectives <coughs> for yourself from now on. Even if you do it like in the coffee shop with some post-it notes, start, start doing that. Um, actively cultivate inclusion. Look around at your team and go, are we too alike? Um, are we losing out because we don't have diversity of, of perspectives, because we don't have different kind of thought? Um, help structure your work into deliberate practice and work out a uh, little bit more on deliberate practice. There's different ways of practicing. Um, I am absolutely incapable of running through a talk to an empty room. I'm too self-conscious for it. And so I've had to find a way to practice my talk without actually practicing my talk. Um, but interestingly, there, is a, um, uh, there, are, there are three methods of deliberate practice, the sports analogy, the music analogy, and the uh, chess analogy, which I won't go into because we're running out of time. Um, but for me, the music analogy is the one that I can use for, for preparation for speaking. Um, you can go through that any use with it um, once, I've, once I've done it, but I, but I just genuinely could not practice if it were to an empty room because I just edit myself too much. Um, figure out where people are on that clue skills matrix and figure out what help they need and how to give it to them. Remember that sometimes your job as a manager is just to be a cheerleader and a ball racer. Um, learn some coaching skills. And then that I think the thing that we do the least well in our industry in general is this thing about a career is more than just a series of jobs. Some people fall through a series of jobs and feel like they've had a wonderful career. <coughs> Um, but I think we can we can do more to help people um, to uh, to find those bigger ponds, find those different challenges, um, without feeling like it has to be absolutely pants. Okay. So, thanks for trouble that we've had a couple of times uh, in our team. Um, so people are pressed and they are struggling to kind of, with what we're trying to support them, they're struggling to find things like mastery day to day because they've kind of got some other issues going on. Um, and I don't think we've found a good way of dealing with that. Um, I, I think, so I've had to deal with that kind of stuff before. Um, I kind of default to remembering the person at the, at the centre of it. Um, that, I've had it on a on a few different occasions. I've had to send people home because it, often because of grief, um, uh, because they had a loss in the family or whatever. And the thing I always say to them is, in a year's time, we will not remember the the team here in the office. We will not remember that you were not here, but your family will remember for the rest of your life that you were there when you needed them. And I think it's I think that kind of approach can be really helpful because when so. It, it then means that when somebody really needs a bit more professional help, um, in a mental health context in particular, they trust that you have their best interests at heart when you say that. You're not trying to just go, like, I have ticked, I have sent them to the psycho psychologist, tick, done, I don't have to care anymore. You're going, I genuinely, I, am, I, I care about you as a person, the job. I want you as a person to be to, to, to feel like you've got the support you need. I appreciate in a small company environment, it is often very hard to carry that kind of um, that kind of difficulty um, just just from the economic impact um, but a lot of the time if you ask the people around you <coughs> would we be acting differently if they'd broken their leg yeah. would we be more supportive if if it was a visible injury that that's another way to help people around them see see what see what's different um, I think that there hits a point where somebody just needs much more full-time help they, they need to not be trying to work um, but for a lot of folks with uh, with mental health challenges actually the structure of coming into work and having people around them and um, being productive in some way is a huge part of healing and, and really and really powerful and really valuable and so I think trying to help help figure out how much of the the challenge you're encountering is actually stigma related so to kind of ask if it were an injury question and then um, just ch changing your expectations if somebody were in so much pain because they've broken their leg, you probably wouldn't expect them to deliver their full workload for the next mm -hmm. six weeks while they've healed, right? Okay. And so uh, try thinking in the same way and applying the, the same things. But there's no there's no magic wand, right? Thank you. Anyone? 
I appreciate it. I'm like between you guys and the lunch. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's one over here. If you're a mentor and a leader, how do you get mentored? What if um, there is no one to mentor you? So I think there's always someone, but there may not be where you work. So uh, when I was when I was still in the really big company, it was great because there was like six more levels of, of people with more experience, and so I used to work them a lot. Um, what what's been interesting is since I've left, I've stayed in touch with a lot of them, but I'm now much more uh, in the midst of what they view as like really innovative stuff. I used to I, I did when I left. Uh, I, one of the reasons that my, my ex, they're very upset about me leaving. I said don't no, a promotion. Nobody says no to. Um, and, and they asked, one of the reasons they asked, they asked me why, I was like, well, because you're kind of more scabbing edge than bleeding edge. That's it's really becoming a problem for me. People don't like being told they're scabbing edge. Um, they really were healing edge, but I was trying to be nice. Um, uh, I think what's interesting is that often with, with that kind of mentoring, where you, where you found somebody more senior, eventually you'll start to mentor them back, right? It becomes a, it becomes a two-way thing. I think if, you're in a, if you look around at your immediate environment and don't find someone, again, I know very few people who have been approached by someone and go like, I just I need someone to mentor me. I'd like to learn from you. But very few people say no. So find someone who you think um, either some of the past experience they've had is relevant to you, and so you might learn from them, and just ask. Um, or find somebody who maybe they've had a very different life experience than you, and that's why you would learn from them. But I think it's mostly just find someone and ask. You'd be surprised how often they say yes, especially if you buy the cake. <laughs> yeah. um, is there a, do you think there's a meaningful difference between knowing the direction uh, that the company's going or the team's going in and caring about the direction that you're going? How do you care? So, um, I, I think there is a meaningful difference, but I think when you see people who know but don't care, it tells you more about how empowered they feel than anything else. So somebody's, or, or, or that it is out of sync with their personal values. So like. Um, a tobacco company um, or an alcohol company can be as clear as they like about their direction and their intents. Um, if it is out of, for me personally, it will always be out of sync with what I care about. So it doesn't matter how clear it is, how transparent it is, I don't care about getting more teenagers drunk. I, <laughs> not, not, it, it's nowhere on the relevant to my interests uh, list, right? Um, but I think if it's something that somebody should find compelling and should find interesting, it's what they say they care about. If they don't care, that's often because they don't feel like they actually have skin in that game. Um, and that's an interesting thing to explore why. And sometimes it's because they, they feel like they're being other, they're being they're an outsider in some way in that in that organization, or they don't feel like they actually have any real say. They that they're experiencing it as uh, command and control even if you don't know it that way. Which is an interesting situation to be in, but is often what I've seen when people are in that kind of situation. Does that help? Yeah. I'm going to draw it to a close now. Um, cool. I'm going to stay here for anybody else who wants to come and ask questions. If they come and ask questions instead of going in for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>